Hi, everybody, and welcome to Intelligence Squared. I'm John Donvan. And as you all know, we do debates on this program, but sometimes we also just have conversations where we step back and examine the art of debate itself and how we can do it better and where it fits into the culture. We've always looked at debate as an exercise in persuasion, an effort undertaken not just to shed some light, but also to change minds. So when we heard about the book, How Minds Change, The Surprising Science of Belief, Opinion, and Persuasion, we knew we had to bring in science journalist David McCraney, its author. So here he is. David, thanks so much for joining us. I'm very happy to be here. I'm looking forward. This is one of those places where I'm like, oh, these will be good questions uh, <laughs> because you already have a familiarity with the topic that uh, I did not have when I first jumped into it. So this is great. Well, well, speaking of that, I have read almost all of the book, but the, the part that really, really caught me was when I was actually still in the introduction mm -hmm. and you were talking about I'm going to quote from this, the ability to change minds, dot, 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 is one of our greatest strengths. Mm -hmm. You'll see why to leverage that strength, we must avoid debate, mm -hmm. dot, dot, dot. Debates have winners and losers, and no one wants to be a loser. And my heart stopped because, sure. because that's our thing. That's, that's what we do here. <laughs> and then further on in the second to last chapter, uh, you're quoting, um, I believe, your friend Misha, uh, a paraphrasing, saying, debate seems like a civil way to manage disagreements because of instead of attacking each other with clubs, we're attacking each other with words. But this is a dangerous concept because the only way to win a debate is to avoid changing one's own mind. Only mm -hmm. the loser of a debate learns anything new and no one wants to be a loser. So I want to save my, my defense of what we do for a little bit later in the conversation. Sure. But look more at the, the thought process and the research process that got you to to where you had that view of what happens when two people sit down to to have an argument with one another typically and mm -hmm. and and ha and ways to push through that with the framework that that kind of motivates us and certainly motivates you is the recognition that we're so polarized as a society there must be a better way for us to be talking to each other so let's start out with how you got into the into this um line of of, of inquiry sure sure and and a Sub sub spoiler. I'll, I'll let you know. I, I I don't think debate is dumb. I don't think debate has no value. I just uh, oh, that's it's, that's it's a relief. <laughs> when and when and where we should employ the sort of what we should do the sort of debating that involves lecterns, except we're doing it in our living rooms is mm -hmm. kind of what I'm talking about. But how did I get into this? Oh wow! Like well, I've been covering uh, this as a beat, kind of as uh, my beat has been. I like to say it's motivated reasoning or the psychology of um, self delusion. Um, it's the psychology, the neuroscience behind uh, reasoning, decision making, and judgment. I've been covering that under "You Are Not So Smart" as sort of my personal brand. That I, I've been doing that for a while, for about thirteen years. Um, I was I've been putting out a podcast every other week of, where I bring in scientists to talk about those sort of things, and we often talk about motivated reasoning. And if you've never heard of the term motivated reasoning, it, you've definitely experienced it. It's um, my go-to example these days is if you've ever, uh, have you ever had a friend who just recently uh, fell in love with someone and you ask them, uh, well, what do you like about them? Which is, you're basically asking them, please present your reasons for falling in mm -hmm. love. Mm -hmm. And they'll say something like, oh, well, I mean, what, what isn't there to like about them? But I, I like, I just like the way they walk. I, I like the way they, they talk. I like the way they, I even like the way they cut their food. I, I, I love the music they're introducing me to. And you hear all these things and it's great. They're head over heels. And then later on, if that same friend is um, breaking up with that person, uh, you ask them, well, why are you breaking up with them? And they'll say things like, well, the way they walk is like all janky, jiggly. Uh, and the way they talk, is, is, it's great, so my nerves. Uh, oh, the way they cut their food, like they cut s snicker bars with a knife and fork. It drives me crazy. And the, the music they make me listen to all the time, I hate their music. So like you may notice here, this, these facts remain the exact same facts about the world. Uh, but reasons for can become reasons against when the motivation to search for reasons has changed. And the, that is sort of the essence of motivated reasoning. You're, you, you're rationalizing and justifying your emotional state or your intentions. And you're cherry picking from all the evidence in the world, something that you think could justify or rationalize that. And oftentimes when people, uh, argue with one another, what they're doing is they're just presenting rationalizations and justifications and letting those do battle, but they're never actually talking about the thing that encouraged them to search for these things. And those may not actually be 
the justifications. That's just sort of the just so stories, the post hoc things they've come up with. So this is something that I've talked about a lot. And I, the way this book became an idea was I had, I was giving a lecture and afterwards someone came up to me and asked how they could help their dad get out of a conspiracy theory that they, that their father had fallen into. And, um, I remember telling them you can't because I was telling them this is the, what's actually happening is blah, 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 all the stuff I was just talking to you about. Just, right. And I, I didn't agree with that exactly as it was coming out of my mouth. It was like locking your keys in your car. I was, I felt like, do I know enough about this to say something like that? And I didn't want to be this pessimistic entity. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't like that worldview. And I, I wondered if I could, it was there a way to reach out to people. And at the same time I was saying this, the norms and values and attitudes and opinions around same sex marriage in the United States had drastically changed. And so I went looking to into that to see had anyone charted it. And sure enough, I brought someone on the podcast, a political scientist who said it was the fastest recorded social change. So, so just, so what I hear you were presented with was on the one hand, you found yourself saying it's impossible to change somebody's, it's very, very, very difficult to change somebody's mind. And then on the other hand, you're looking about how the whole culture had changed its mind in a very short right. period of time. And, and so there, that was the conundrum that you wanted to go out and understand. Yeah. Cause, cause a thought experiment immediately just like popped in my mind is because it was around, uh, 10 years or so was the rapid shift from 60 or percent or so of people being opposed to 60% of people being in favor. And I was imagining all these millions of people in the United States, if you put them in a time machine and sent them back a decade, what would they do if they discussed this issue with their, with their own selves from the past? Would they argue about it the way we do today other wedge, over wedge issues? Either way, what happened over the course of that decade that changed their mind? And I didn't, I don't, I didn't mean it in a sort of a sociological sense. I want to know what happened in their brains. And then I, that, to me, became this question: How do we change our minds? Why do we resist? And how would you break through that? And are there people who know these things? And that's how I jumped into the topic. Can we start a little bit with one of the points you made? You just brought up, which was why do we resist changing our minds? <laughs> there are many, many reasons why we change our minds. Uh, the uh, while we resist changing our minds, the first would be s simple reactance. Uh, reactance is uh, if you have like a, if you have if you've ever been a teenager or you have teenagers or you had a teenager at some point in your life, um, and like th their room very much does need to be cleaned, and uh, and they know that the sentence "I should clean my room" is in their head because they know their room looks like like something out of an episode of Hoarders. Uh, and then you say, hey, and they're, you know, a mom or a dad says, hey, you need to clean up your room. Like, and then that the reactance is when you go, oh, really? And you like immediately go throw a candy wrapper on the, on the pile so you can Scrooge McDive into it to go to sleep. Like you're, it's this reactance is the feeling we get whenever our agency has been put at the, in, into some sort of uh, the suggestion of threat. And so that's one of the reasons we resist. If, if, if at first blush, the conversation seems like the other person is attempting to push into our, uh, agency, that's going to cause some pushback. The, um, the other reasons we resist, there's, there's one that comes from schemas and there's one that would, the two bigger ones, or if comes one's from schemas and the other would be coming from our, um, our, our sort of, uh, tribal orientations. The, the simplest one would be something related to uh, how we change our minds at all, which is assimilation and accommodation. Um, that's the principles first put forth by Jean Piaget. It's, it's really sort of a description of how we learn anything. Um, Can you remind folks who Piaget was and how long ago he was? Oh yeah, Piaget. I love. I think of Piaget every time I get a, a, a mixed drink in a tall glass because I'm like, oh, you're not fooling me. I I know what's going on here. Because <laughs> Piaget, you may remember from Psych 101 classes, is. He's always usually described as the the, the famous experiment with um, you, you put some some liquid in a short glass and then you pour it into a tall glass and you ask children, do you now magically have more like liquid? And at a certain age, children seem to in, intuit, oh, no, 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 I know what's happening here. But before that age, the intuition is, yeah, there's magically more. And he did that work for uh, the study of the, of like I think he called it genetic epistemology. Or it was the idea was, how does knowledge build and form and you know, are there stages to that? Or is there an arc to it? And in, so in doing that, he developed this amazing model of uh, assimilation accommodation. The way it, to make it make sense without having to jump into a lot of psychological gobbledygook is 
um, like when a kid first sees a, a, a dog for the first time and you, you do uh, adults all around will do that thing and go, yeah, dog, dog, dog. You're like explaining what we call this thing. Something categorical happens in the mind of, of a child. It's non-human and it walks on four legs. It's uh, covered in fur. It's not wearing any clothes, has a tail dog. And then later on, they may see a, uh, a horse. And when they see it, they point to it and say dog, or if they're a little more advanced, they'll say big dog. Um, because it seems to fit the category. It's non-human and it's got it's walking on four legs, it's not wearing any clothes, got a waggy tail. So this is an attempt at assimilation to fit it into your existing model. Which but, which which represents yeah. a kind of changing of the mind. Mm-hmm. Changing it is a, change, it mind is, change, right? that is a mind change. Absolutely. To go right. From uh, from from big dog to oh no, that's a horse. Right. And so when you when you sit when you accept that, okay, this is a horse. You have to develop another category which in which both horse and dog will fit. And they may not have a name for it yet, but it's like animal or creature, which is expanding your mind, accommodating the new information. And we're doing this all the time. This conversation, we're doing that. Anyone listening is doing that. All throughout the day, you're learning and expanding. Some things, though, seem to fit into what you already understand. Some things require some accommodation. At some level, though, your model of reality is so robust and complex, you've had so many experiences it's just way easier to assimilate and way more dangerous to accommodate because you might become dangerously incorrect. So we want. Wait, can, this, you, can you define assimilation? Uh, wh- how that's different from accommodation? Assimilation is the is would be trying would be saying that's a dog, whereas accommodation would be uh, going, oh, it's a horse, and you to accommodate you have to create a new category in which both will fit. Uh, but this is also true of uh, if you were uh, <laughs> if you walked into your kitchen this afternoon and there was a. a a marching band of frogs in there playing jazz, your first reaction wouldn't be, oh, I didn't know frogs could do that. And you would attempt to assimilate it into what you already understand about the world. You'd think, maybe I took some psychedelics. Maybe this is a hologram. Maybe I have a friend playing a trick on me. Maybe I need to see a doctor. More from Intelligence Squared U.S. when we return. Welcome back. I'm John Donvan, and this is Intelligence Squared U.S. Let's jump right back into our discussion. When people are trying to change our minds, uh, oftentimes if what they're presenting to us is something that would require us to accommodate, we will resist because we walk a sort of tightrope, which is not changing your mind when you should is dangerous, but changing your mind when you shouldn't is also dangerous. And it's better to err on the side of assimilation because our models have gotten us to where we're at today. So that's, that, those are the base levels of resistance. But the strongest resistance is going to be anything that threatens to uh, shame you or ostracize you. It's anything that threatens your social identity is, is where the strongest resistance will come from. It's interesting you say shame you because I, I, I understand you're saying that, it, that the, the, the change in position, the change of a point of view could actually threaten one whole, one's whole existence in a sort of public way and a sense of identity. But might there also just be embarrassment that you were wrong, not wanting to admit that you were wrong because that means that maybe you spent a long, long time being wrong. <laughs> there is and there's a great variation in this you know they call uh some domains we just refer to this simply as intellectual humility and we, we seem to be pretty nuanced in this regard or there's a spectrum there are people who are readily uh accept and are okay with being wrong and even find it pleasurable uh and seek it out and there are terms for this there's all sorts of things scientific curiosity depends on who you're talking to what sort of label they put on top of it Need for cognition sometimes is uh, it falls into this category, but there are also people who for and there's just, there are a thousand different reasons why someone would feel the way you just described. Where fe- being wrong hurts me. It could be the culture with which they grew up uh, really it deeply emphasized that um, being a dumb dumb or being wrong makes you a bad person. Or there's also the sense that uh, there is something along the narcissism spectrum that in which this will uh, make me seem untrustworthy to my peers. But in the end of the day, almost all of those things, all those feelings are emanating from a sense that my place within my trusted peer group is at threat if I admit to the fact that I was wrong all this time. And it may feel like it's you in isolation feeling that, yeah. but you're feeling the audience is what's really taking place. 
but sometimes the audience is actually harsh in its judgment of somebody who changes its mind, his, his or her <laughs> mind. I'm thinking particularly of, of a politician who, who switches a position, is not accused of growth or evolution or insight, new insight, but merely of being a flip-flopper and mm -hmm. is attacked for having a different position. Yeah. And, and you notice it's, an, it's, this isn't something that we don't, we don't lob those, like, like we don't lob those insults at people in other positions in the society, right? We don't do that at a, at a professor or an academic necessarily. We won't do that maybe unless it's someone who we've invested a lot of group identity into, uh, or especially if it's someone who where we feel like the stakes are, this is someone who could win or lose an election based off what just happened. Like th that, that desire for consistency also emanates from these feelings of, of groupishness. And uh, I think that we, as, as uh, if you're the more Western you are, the more uh, 21st century you are from my home culture, like in the deep South the United States, like there's this real cultural value of individualism that assumes that you aren't influenced by other people. Like you, all of your thoughts and all of your beliefs and attitudes and values are the result of going down into some sort of like castle and looking at all your scrolls by candlelight and saying, this is what I feel about gun control. And the idea that you're being deeply influenced by norms or being deeply influenced by the possibility of sanction from the people who you live around or you grew up with is kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's not salient most of the time. And, and it, it's a, odd feeling to think I'm not, maybe I am less individualistic than I thought I was. And it's because we have such a strong cultural value for it. So talk a little bit about the, the framework in which you say debate is not a hopeful, a helpful model. Well, I mean, I used to think it was, I, I used to definitely be on the, on in the, in that, uh, I would say there's a, a sort of a peanut butter and chocolate of comeuppance in this book for me as a, as a science writer and just as a person. Um, and this framing of debate is one of those things. The, the idea that you need to, the idea that um, once you have a, you're in a disagreement with someone, that the best outcome is for you to win the argument and for them to lose it, mm -hmm. for you to assert that you're right and they're wrong, is a way to absolutely limit the poss is to really reduce the possibility that e that you're going to arrive at the truth if that matters to you in some way or another. I think as an odd way of uh, defending my thesis here. Uh, do you mind if we talk about the dress for a second? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I, I want to mention that you tell this story in the book, and I want to take a very brief time out to say how much I liked the significant portions of the book that I read. And I started with a great deal of skepticism because there are a lot of writers out there who are telling stories by cherry picking science and studies that are, give the impression that, that I've learned something new about humanity and it's very, very often relying on neuroscience and imaging, things like that, that I just find tedious to read. And what you did was something very different. You, you, found, you went out and found people who are successfully changing people's minds mm -hmm. with overlapping uh, techniques, um, by which I mean they're all, they all kind of develop their own techniques, but you found overlap. And it's very enlightening and also very entertaining. And your story about the dress fits right into that. <laughs> well, as a, as a brief tangent, I thank you so much for what you just said, because that's not how the book for, first started. Like, I, I knew I didn't want to write a book that was going to just be Wikipedia with jokes, where I, had a, I, I was like, here's something I want to tell the world about. Let me, make, let me get all the research that supports my uh, you know, assumptions and then present that to you. I don't like those science books either. Um, so I didn't want to do that. But when I first ventured out to try to understand this topic, the like I remember one of the first people I spoke with was Jim Alcock. And he's been studying belief at the time I interviewed him for about 40 years. And one of my first questions was just, uh, hey, tell me what belief, what a belief is. Like, tell me, pretend I'm five years old and tell me what a belief is. And he just blew, he just, he just went, ugh. <laughs> and, and I felt the, my stomach flip over five times. And... Uh, He's like, that is a tough one. And I, and I said, you've been studying belief for 40 years. You can't just give me a definition. He's like, that's why I can't give you a definition. And I remember thinking, oh, no, um, I'm going to have to go back and tell my editors that I don't know if I can actually do this. And that's happened more and more often in the beginning. And I realized I am going to have to kind of, I'm going to have to go out in the world and talk to people who've changed their minds in drastic ways and then start there instead and that's how I ended up going to places like Westboro and to conspir conspiracy theory conventions and hang out, hanging out with flat earthers and stuff like that. People who had left those groups. 
And then I took that and went back to scientists and said, hey, I saw this, this, and this. Could you help me understand what I was seeing? And that's when it started to, to build some momentum. And it, Eventually, by the end of the book, as you said, I spend time with people who change minds professionally or they have experiment in this world or they study it. My editors were, were brilliant in saying, uh, here's how you, fin how you make this work. The story of the book should just be you say, you starting with, I would like to explore this. Would you like to come with me? Let's go on that journey together. And the authoritative voice will arrive by the end of the book if you get there. And it works much better that way. And it really works. Thank you. It was, and, I, and, I, and I love it being on the ground and in person. And you're hearing the, the questions be asked and answered. And one of those things was what you're talking about. I, I knew to tell to the story, I had to tell you how minds are made and how they change at the level of neurons so we could work up to what's going on when persuasion is being res is resisted or it, it works. And I was very worried about that because I was like, "This is gonna, we're going to lose a lot of momentum in this story when I have to pull back and go, okay, let's talk about dopamine. But I had this wonderful gift of, I was talking about this with someone at NYU and they told me, actually, there's, there's somebody here who's researching something I think could play into this and you would, en you would enjoy meeting them. They're, they're the uh, researchers who figured out why, we see, why people see the dress differently. And if, if you, I'm sure everybody remembers this. I haven't yeah, met anyone who doesn't, him. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I have never met a single person on this planet or any, any country that doesn't remember this. It was but 2015, you, I think, right? But it was in 2015. Yeah. So in case you don't remember it, there was a dress that hit the internet. The very short version of what happened of what, for people who don't know the backstory of it. I didn't know the backstory of it was a, uh, a woman whose daughter was getting married, went to a, a dress shop in London. She took a picture of a dress on a cloudy day with a very crappy phone and uh, sent it to her family and said, do you think this would look nice? And people in the family were, some of them were saying, I don't know if you should wear a gold dress to the, to the wedding. And some were saying, I don't know if you should wear a blue dress to the wedding. And she was like, what are you talking about? And then other people was like, what are you talking about? And there was this confusion because no one could agree on what color this dress was. And it seems pretty distant. Like, it's not like brown, black. It's it's gold or blue. Uh, gold and uh, white or blue and uh, blue and brown. And it just so happened that the, this became a funny story they told. And the, the musician at the wedding uh, was much more plugged into social media than everybody else and spread it to social media. And eventually it made its way to BuzzFeed and Wired and all these other places. It eventually broke the internet for a little while. It was trending so much on Twitter that Twitter stopped working for a little while because of all the hashtags. And super celebrities were chiming in and it was on local news at the end of every broadcast. It really spanned the planet. So... You've probably seen it by now. If not, you can just type in, and this is a pretty amazing, you can just type the dress. That's all you have to type into Google and you'll see a picture of it. So yeah, roughly half of the people who look at it see it as black and blue and the other half see it as white and gold. Well, I met the researchers who figured this out and the answer to why the, how, how they figured this out and what the answer was is also the answer to your question as to why debate isn't always the right way to deal with disagreement, which is the long story short of what they figured out was um, they had a lot of, these are neuroscientists, they had a lot of experience with vision, was that uh, we, when we're, we don't know we're doing this, it's happening outside of our awareness, but it's happening before we experience something subjectively, is if something is overexposed, if we have experience with that kind of overexposure, we will do what they, is called subtract the luminant. And I say we, I mean the brain is doing this on, beha on our behalf before it reaches subjective experience. Yeah, and in moments of ambiguity where we don't know whether or not this has been over what, what sort of nature the light of the overexposure is we'll lean on our priors so let me let me reduce that to something that's easier to make sense of um when it came to the dress the more time a person had spent around sunlight or around windows or the more if they were early riser then that meant the more time they had spent uh around things being overexposed in sunlight and since it was ambiguous as to what sort of light was overexposing that dress, based off of their experiences, they would subtract the overexposure of sunlight or skylight, which is mostly in the blue side of the spectrum. And they end up with a white and gold dress. People who've spent more time working at night, they don't, maybe there's not a lot of windows around them. They're, they're just uh, they're, they're night owls. They've seen more things overexposed in artificial light which are incandescent light, which is in the yellow side of the spectrum. So they subtract the yellow. 
and they get a blue dress. The thing is, uh, what happened here was something was novel and ambiguous, and they disambiguated it using their previous experiences. And all of that happened outside of awareness. It never registered. Oh, so, it, so it was an, it was an automatic. It was an automatic process was happening at some. Yeah, for me, the level. big like mm -hmm. the, the the firework like thing here. The, the thing that makes fireworks go off in my mind is the ambiguity never registered. But that still resulted in a disagreement. Like, no, I cannot deny the truth of my own perception, the truth of my own eyes. I see this dress as blue, and the other person feels the same way. So. There's a word for this, disambiguation. There's a term for this. It's called surf pad. Uh, substantial uncertainty in the presence of ramified or forked prior assumptions will yield disagreement. Long story short, what it means is all of your life experiences leading up to a moment of, of ambiguity will be employed to disambiguate it on your behalf, and you will have no idea it's happened, and you'll just experience it as the truth. The truth. Mm -hmm. So you have two people with two very different life experiences. When they are both in the presence of something ambiguous, they will both disambiguate differently and get two different subjective truths out of it. And that will yield a big disagreement. And we are experiencing that all the time these days, you may have noticed. Here's what plays into the debate as far as I'm concerned. Imagine, and this is some of the, this, the neuroscientists mentioned this to me. Um, they, they talked about wanting a surf, a surf padified discourse and with that instead of a debate discourse. Imagine two people who see the dress decide they want to get into a debate as to what color it is. And, you know, the function of the debate is I want to prove that I'm right and you're wrong, that you're, you're misperceiving it and I'm correctly perceiving it. Uh, the winner of that debate loses everything because they, they, get, they don't get close to the truth because they're trying to face off against each other and settle on, on one sort of uh, reality. If they were to go shoulder to shoulder instead and say, I find you a rational, rational, reasonable, intelligent person, I wonder why we would disagree over something like this. And it's only in the exploration of why do we disagree that you have any possibility of getting to this deeper truth of, oh, wow, it, there's, there's something like neurological taking place, which is outside the domain of it is this color, it's not this color. And so that is the, that's the framing I use to get into the later portions of the book. Yeah, it's just that, that that particular uh, example is so interesting to me because I, I definitely saw um, gold and white, and <laughs> members of my family saw blue and black, and I understand the dress actually is blue and black. I tried to see blue and black. I try, you know, with with the uh, those those optical illusions where you see the young woman who's a witch at the same time, and your your mind mm -hmm. can flip back and forth. That I can do. I can see both sides of that one. Right. But I could I could not do that with the. With the blue and black dress, I could not find blue and black in that. I just I hear you, but there's terms there. By the way, the 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 images that we can see is like the rabbit and the duck and the vase yeah. and, the, mm -hmm. and the faces. Those are called interpersonal bistable illusions. But the dress is an example of something called an intrapersonal bistable illusion. So interpersonal, every brain it sees this as ambiguous and it flips between two different interpretations. But intrapersonal. It's ambiguous, but no no one is privy to the fact that it is because your brain settles on only one of those two, and then yeah. that becomes the the subjective reality for that thing. And I know I hope you're you're I hope you're seeing where you can like extend this into uh, a person's opinion on something like immigration or gun control. The priors you're talking about, in other mm -hmm. words, what their assumptions are going in, what their experiences have been going Assum in. Yeah, assumptions that don't feel like assumptions mm -hmm. uh, and uh, ambiguities that never register. And that's sort of what the persuasion techniques that I outline in, in, my, in my book help people discover those things between, in a big open conversation with another human being. So I want to talk about those techniques, but I want to, I want to just circle back to, sure. to, the, to the challenge to debate. Uh, I understand you're, now what you're saying is that very often when two people disagree, the effort of each to persuade the other that they're wrong kind of gets you nowhere, that that kind of debate doesn't really, really work. Mm -hmm. Dead end debate, yeah. But what, what we've been doing at our program now since 2006 is putting on one side of, a, of an issue, talking with another side of an issue. But there's a third party there, and that's the audience. Yeah. And each side is trying to persuade the audience, as opposed to each other, they're in fact not trying to persuade each other. Mm -hmm. There was no expectation that our debaters would ever change each other's mind. But in mm -hmm. that format, we not only feel that light was shed, but that people actually, actually changed their minds. And 
so to that degree, I'm standing solidly in defense of, of the kind of the debate that we do and, and the role that that can play. Again, like I love debate. I love watching debates. I love the framing of it and the academic sort of history of it. And, and it's not in the book because I, I went there, but I, I never I didn't put it in there. But for the sake of researching it, I, I went to the Dionysium in Austin, Texas, where they have formal old, old school like Greek debates over really strange issues sometimes. And I, I would do the same thing. I would go to the audience and say, did, anybody, did you change your mind? Did you change your mind? And it was fascinating on both sides. People who did or did not change their mind always had uh, interesting uh, stories as to what it was that, that like clicked them over or didn't click them over. The, but I do like, but I'm obviously, as you see, as you hear what I'm saying, like I'm arguing against a certain kind of framing where one person meets another person as attempting to obliterate them. So what you're up to is a, a little different than that. Uh, and we could, there are plenty of studies into this too, about people who, uh, go to the debate and, uh, lots of confirmation bias and lots of other biases, uh, jump into the picture and they only pay attention. I, I went to a bunch of debates in Texas too, uh, um, atheists versus theologians, uh, and, and to, just to notice how people would pick and choose who they were listening to and discount good arguments. But most of the time, the modulating factor there was group identity. If group identity is part of the debate, that's when people will really resist saying, oh, you changed my mind. But the stuff you do is fantastic. I hope, I hope, I'm, being, I hope I'm being clear here. More from Intelligence Squared U.S. when we return. Welcome back to Intelligence Squared U.S. I'm John Donvan. Let's get back to our debate. We still love hearing you talk about how minds are changed because, of course, uh, our debaters may not be trying to change their opponent's mind, but they're trying to get the audience to think differently. And you, in the book, um, you go through several examples of situations where there was an individual or a party or an organization motivated to change somebody else's mind. And you found that they had discovered in some ways, studied up for or stumbled upon techniques for being more successful at that. What's your favorite example from the book about that? Um, it's hard to pick. I have, I have two. Uh, there, there are several examples, so I can reduce it to two. But, and, it's, and the reason it's, there are two is because they, one is, is focused on sort of fact-based persuasion, and the other is focused on attitude and value-based. Um, this is the great magic of, of of writing of writing a book like this and researching it, I could have never expected this was going to be a thing. I, when I went out looking for people who who professionally or or sometimes through therapeutic models and have scientific uh, endeavors involved, they're trying to figure out how to properly persuade people. Many of these groups had never heard of each other, nor were they aware of the uh, scientific literature that. The, the, upon which their their work was was based, or or the therapeutic practices that had been doing something similar for years, so unaware of each other, they had gone through a very long period of A B testing. The deep canvassing people that I met had had done seventeen thousand conversations. But by the time I met them, recorded conversations. Uh, the street epistemology group, same thing. They had more than ten thousand conversations recorded. So thousands and thousands of conversations, throwing away what didn't work, keeping what did, they had independently arrived at techniques that on paper looked pretty much the same. And if they were in steps, the steps were pretty much the same and they were in the same order. And I, I think I say this in the book, it, it seems like no matter who invented the first airplane, like someone today could would look at it and go, that looks like an airplane because the they're all dealing with the same challenges uh, when you're trying to build an airplane. You're trying to deal with physics and the physics of planet Earth and the materials we have on hand. So you're going to build something that we all agree that looks like an airplane. When it comes to these techniques, something similar as it was at play, the, they're all dealing with the same challenges of how brains make sense of the world and how we deal with uh, incoming information that is counter-attitudinal or counterfactual that is surprising in some way. And how do you approach that where the, you don't get massive pushback? And so 
I don't know if you'd like me to go through both of them, but we can go through well, one Well, no, let's just do, let's, let's do deep canvassing. Uh, we may okay. not have time for, for everything, so let's, uh, let's make deep canvassing okay, with deep, the, the case. Say, street epistemology is for fact-based things. Like, do you think the earth is flat or round? Um, and if the person says it's flat, then you go from there. Uh, deep canvassing is more for issues that are politically charged. Uh, they have group identity in them. They're attitude-based or value-based. Though the person you're spending time with may not know that or they may not be consciously aware of it. It may feel like raw facts to them. They all, all, these, all these techniques start out with step one, which may be the most important step, which is to build rapport. With deep canvassing, they go door to door. They meet with strangers. They just knock on someone's door one day and say, would you like to talk about abortion rights? Would you like to talk about transgender bathroom rights? Things like that. The reason building rapport is so important is because we're all social primates. And the first thing you're concerned about is, is this person going to put me in a position of shame with my trusted peers? Is this person going to get, put me at a threat of ostracism? Or is this person trying to take my, uh, steal my agency in some way or threaten that? Is this person going to be hostile and this is going to end up being something where I might have to defend myself, even bodily? So rapport building is very important to set the stage to get all that off the table. And oftentimes they'll just say, I'm not here to change your mind, because they're really not. They're not that's the, the goal is to get you to explore your, your reasoning. And they say, I would just love to hear your thoughts on this, your opinions on this, where, where they come from. And you go from there. Um, the next thing that they do, and this was just introduced because when they were studied by scientists, they needed a, um, a way to quantify it, but it turns out this is vital to the process. Um, you can think of it like if you were to ask somebody, well, the next step is adding a scale from one to 10 or zero to 100. And you can think of it like this. And I often like demonstrating it like this. We could do it right now. I'll, I'll, how, how about we do it right now? Just for a very, something very neutral. John, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk to you about your, about a, your most recent, the most recent movie you watched. What, what was the, What was the last movie you remember watching? I watched the prequel to the Sopranos called okay. All the Saints in Newark. Oh, yeah, all the Saints. Uh, did you like it? What do you think of it? I liked it. You liked it, yeah. I'm wondering, like, if you were a movie reviewer, you had to give it, like, 1 to 10. Like, what would you give it on a scale from 1 to 10? I'd give it an 8. An 8. So you said you liked it. I hear, I hear you. And you gave it an 8. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering how come, what didn't, how come it didn't get up to a 9? Uh, a 9 or a 10 would have meant that there was nothing that I would have made, I would have liked to have seen improved in it. So yeah. it wasn't, those nine and 10 would have been, I couldn't recommend any changes to make this better. And, and, and I'll, ask, I'll ask this last thing and then we'll get back to the, what we're talking about. But what, what in particular keeps it from getting up to being a nine or a 10? Some of it's the just casting. just one little thing. Yeah, casting. Some, of the, some of the casting seemed um, uh, a little bit off. Not, yeah. not, con- not fully convincing to me. Mm-hmm. So you see, John, this is a very easy demonstration of what we're talking about here. Like, it is so easy to say, I liked it. In, in a way, it's like, it's almost like bumping your knee uh, on a table and, and you ask, did that hurt? And all you do is just sample your body and say, body says hurt. Yeah, it hurt. Mm-hmm. And then when it comes to an attitude uh, or a position on an issue, you can say, uh, did you like it? Are you for or against it? Is that good or bad? And all you have to do is sample your body for a second. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. I liked it. But the next step, when I ask you to, to put it on a scale, now we have to enter into metacognition. And oftentimes mm-hmm. people will go, um, hmm, well, that um, hmm, well is that moment of, oh, they have entered into active yeah. processing. They are meta, then you're going to do a guided metacognition with them going forward. They may have never considered this before. Yeah, I just so, said that. Yeah. So, yeah. And so after the, after they're on the scale, you find where that on the scale in uh, deep canvassing in particular, uh, they will ask, why does that number feel right to you? Which is a much more open-ended way of doing what I was just doing. And they're offering them an opportunity to may- introspect maybe for the first time. And then they then they'll share a story about someone uh, who has been affected by the issue. The canvasser will. The person who's asking the questions will share a story about someone who's affected by the issue. Sometimes if it's a if it's a current like political issue, they will show like the... Um, the attack ads from the other side and stuff to try to really get the conversation going. And they'll re-ask the question to see if the attack ads move the person. And after that, after they, if the number is moved a little bit, they'll ask, well, what do you think it moved? And once they get the reasons out there in the open, 
um, you start trying to make their argument for them. Like, like if I'm hearing you correctly, like they'll say, what reasons are you, do you have to hold this the position? They'll try to re- repeat back so that you have done an incredible job of presenting their argument for them. So they have a really solid debate worthy argument proposition almost. And they'll ask things like, was there a time in your life before you felt that way? Um, and what, what led to this current attitude? And in a way, what they're asking is what methods are you using to, uh, to judge the uh, quality of your reasoning here, mm-hmm. and how, go- how it, good a scientist are you? Really? Yeah, you know, what is your what is your epistemology? Without having to say any of those things, because we so naturally can explain ourselves in that way, and you just listen and you summarize and you repeat and you reflect. And I know this sounds impossible, but that is pretty much all of there is to it: is being a non judgmental listener in a way that allows a person to explore their reasoning process in a way that they may have never done before. And it's almost impossible for a person not to move a little bit in some way or another. And uh, for some issues, they'll share their, their personal story if they're personally affected by it. And then they offer them an opportunity to have more conversations. As surprising as this is, this has had such strong impact that uh, while I was visiting them in uh, Los Angeles when they were doing this, they had scientists from around the world, you know, like researching how this works and why it is so powerful. And it was, it's was it been employed since then um, in phone banks for uh, uh, people running for office. It's been employed for all sorts of prop, uh, propositions going forth before uh, votes. And it's very powerful. So how I understand that completely. It sounds very powerful. How is it not a bad faith manipulation? In other words, um, you know, you're you're talking to somebody and you're, and you're pulling these levers. You're not necessarily sharing that you're pulling these levers. You may be a very, very nice guy about it. You may, one may be a very nice guy about it, may be very gentle, may be sounding non-judgmental, but you have an agenda to get mm-hmm. the other person. It's it's not a two-way street. There's sort of somebody pulling the levers and the other person's levers are being pulled and it's mm-hmm. not in both directions. And I just wonder ethically about that. At least in our debates, it's up front that both sides are out there to sort of try to take each other, other's arguments down. Yeah, I hear you completely on this. Uh, and I've asked them those same questions. Uh, when it comes to deep canvassing, it's up to the organization using it, how much, how open they want to be. Uh, some of the people I've spent time with, they prefer not to divulge that they're using a technique they've learned. Others are much more in favor of, I will be completely open at every point of the process and tell you what's going on here, and I'll get your consent, or else I'm not going to go forward, which I prefer that approach. In street epistemology, which uses very similar steps, they outright say, you may not, you cannot do this without getting full consent and telling them what's, what you're doing and asking them if it's okay with them. Um, at the end of the day, for it to remain ethical in my mind is... Uh, it just can't be coercion. The other person has to have come. They have to have. You have to have total buy-in, and you're not attempting to. Your the goal should be: Are you helping this person introspect deeply on something that they may never have been afforded an opportunity to do? Uh, and if so, where they arrive is whether they end up being for or against the thing that we're talking about. That's fine. The the idea is that you want them to have an actual opinion that they may never have had before. And yeah. I mean, you, 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 them- you, you, you yourself actually referred to the, the potential that this could be a dark art. That's the phrase mm-hmm. you use, and you put it in quotation marks. And that's kind of what I'm getting at also. I found when you, you, you write a lot about and have referred to street epistemology a lot, and mm-hmm. I'm drawing a blank. I apologize right now. No, it's okay. I thought I had it in my notes, the, the guy who does this, and he's been... Uh, Anthony, Anthony Magnum Bosco, yeah. Yeah. So he goes out. Um, and makes videos, and, and this has grown into a huge movement, mm-hmm. but he's been doing it for 15 or 16 years. He'll go, started out going to college campuses. He went there as an atheist, as I understand, mm-hmm. and in the early days, he would stop students at random, and he would have very, very civil, open conversations with them, in the course of which, usually in under five or six minutes, by asking the kinds of questions that you're asking me, would turn an individual from announcing earlier that he or she was a strong Christian to talking about, maybe I have doubts. And he would, and the conversation would end with Anthony more or less saying, you know, it's interesting to me that you have those doubts and you didn't think that you did. And, and as I understand, I haven't looked at Anthony's more recent work, but he's brand, he's not so much focused on debunking 
mm-hmm. Christian faith anymore. But in the early days, he was out there trying to debunk Absolutely. Christian faith and walked away with people's kinds of worlds rocked. And I found that ethically quite dubious. I hear you. And he he looks back on that time with regret and remorse. He, Anthony, who is, there's plenty of people doing this, but Anthony is sort of the, was the, the, the major figure who proselytized it um, and brought it to, to where it's at today. The, it was all based off of a book back in the day called uh, A Manual for Creating Atheists. And the, the, the street epistemology community has, in a lot of ways, schismed from that because by using this process, they couldn't help but like notice what you're noticing now, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm not giving what I have a goal in mind. I have a bias where I want a particular outcome. And over time they developed a rejection of this and a desire instead to all I want is for a person to be a better critical thinker. And if they've never given that a shot, um, I would hope that I help them do that. And wherever they go with it is still okay with me. I just don't want them to be um, landing on conclusions without giving it its due process with you know, their, own, their own heart and mind. The, if you're talking about something that's purely fact-based, then the goal at the end of the day is how close are we getting to the truth? Are we using methods that will get us closer to the truth? If you're not aware of those methods, this, this will help you, under, help you like, develop them. And if it's outside of purely fact-based issues, then are you aware of what's motivating your opinion is sort of the end goal. Yeah. So I, I, I guess the existence of God may be challenging to put in the, into a fact, but we, we've actually done debates on that issue. And one of our earliest debates, the question was the world would be better off without religion. Um, and, and again, the debaters failed to persuade one another, but the audience was very, very stirred up. And, mm-hmm. and, and I don't think the audience felt that one side was being more manipulative than the other. There, I think they felt both sides were trying to be persuasive. But on fact base, you have a scene uh, near the back end of the book where you're in conversation with a flat earther. You know, people flat earthers are people who believe that the earth is flat and that there's a conspiracy to hide this fact from from the larger population. That it's a very very complex, sophisticated uh, cover up job. I'm not clear what the reason is given for why there would be a motivation to do that. But nevertheless, you were in a conversation with an individual. And at least at the beginning of the conversation, you were, as I read you, were trying to explore and and trying to understand why this actually quite articulate fellow who who holds these these beliefs and is kind of a star in this world, um, why he holds this belief in this, that there's, that it's the, the earth is flat and that there's a conspiracy to cover it up. And, you applied some of these techniques uh, in the conversation, which served mostly to kind of expose where he was in his thinking about this. Mm-hmm. But what I was wondering as I was reading it is what you, you start that conversation absolutely believing that he's wrong, right? Mm-hmm. He, he, could he have persuaded you that the earth is flat in that conversation? Was there any, was there, was there a two way street on that? <laughs> when I put on my intellectual humility hat, I would, I would, I would answer you saying, of course, I'm open to any evidence. If you can present more, yeah. and I could go, on and on, like, uh, it's a hypothesis that the earth is round. It's a hypothesis that it's flat. Let's, let's present our evidence to each, to one another. And where the evidence lies, let the chips fall. Away. I would love to say that to you, but I have to admit that, of course, I'm extremely biased on this. But I also, as soon as I start trying to explain it in that way, I can feel it coming up inside me right now, talking to you. Like, I, have I seen the earth from space? No. Have I? About where have I? What? Then how do I know this is true? Well, I've I've seen these pictures and astronauts and documentaries, and I went to school where they show me stuff. And there's math, but I don't understand the math. But I think the people who do seem to know what it's all about. I have a whole lot of trust. Is what I'm really expressing. I trust yeah, yeah, certain yeah. sources. He does not trust those sources. In fact, what we end up discussing is that that's the nature of our disagreement. The nature of our disagreement is actually that he believes that the sources I trust are untrustworthy, and I believe the sources that he trusts are untrustworthy. So the actual conversation that we get to is, how do we determine who to trust? Which is a, a separate conversation that it, that it seemed like we were getting into, but that actually is where it lands, because neither one of us are, the, are have enough expertise in the topic to actually debate if the earth is flat or round. David, thank you so much for joining us. It's really, really, really been a pleasure. And I've learned a lot by listening to you. And um, thanks once again, David, for being on the program. Thank you so much for having me. It's an immense pleasure to spend time with you.
I want to thank all of you for tuning into this episode of Intelligence Squared. You know, as a nonprofit, our work to combat extreme polarization through civil and respectful debate is generously funded by listeners like you, by the Rosencrantz Foundation, and by friends of Intelligence Squared. Intelligence Squared is also made possible by a generous grant from the Laura and Gary Lauder Venture Philanthropy Fund. Robert Rosencrantz is our chairman. Clea Connor is CEO. Leah Mathau is our chief content officer. Julia Melfi and Marlette Sandoval are our producers. Andrew Lipson is head of production. Damon Whittemore, our radio producer. Raven Baker is events and operations manager. Gabrielle Yanicelli is our social media and digital platforms coordinator. And I'm your host, John Donvan. We'll see you next time.